to your seats where we're cranked up here. I have some sheets here in my hand that uh, have Bob and Chris on, uh, Chris Eagle Squire's name on the top. I'll pass around if you'd just like to sign it or put a note on there that you're thinking about them or whatever. Feel free to do that. And we've got three of them that will be going around the room if you want to just uh, say something to them. We'd appreciate it. And Ed is ready to go when he thinks he has a form, he's clear to start. Simply entitled, No, Not Genesis, but in the beginning. And on 
the seventh day, God rested. And on the eighth day, at all 730 hours, God looked down upon the earth and was not happy. So he thought about his labors, and in his infinite wisdom, God created a divine creature, and this he called a marine. <laughs> and these marines, whom God created in his own image, were to be of the air, the land, and the sea. And these he gave many wonderful uniforms. He gave them practical fighting uniforms, so that they could wage war against the forces of Satan and evil. He gave them service uniforms for their daily work and training, so that they might be sharp and ready. And he gave them evening and dress uniforms, sharp, stylish, handsome things, so that they might promenade with the ladies on Saturday night and impress the hell out of everybody. <laughs> And at the end of the eighth day, God looked down upon the earth and saw that it was good. But God was still not happy. Because in the course of his labors, he had forgotten one thing. He did not have a marine uniform. He thought about it and finally satisfied himself in knowing that not everybody can be a marine. <laughs> It is hoped that this presentation provides a macro overview of an overlooked aspect of our war for independence. Namely, that being the contributions of the Continental Marines and also to a lesser extent the various state and privateer Marines. To visually assist in accomplishing this, I intend to highlight the paintings of the late Colonel Charles Waterhouse, the United States Marine Corps Reserve the former artist in residence at Headquarters Marine Corps in D.C. Colonel Waterhouse was a former enlisted infantry Marine who fought in the Pacific during World War II and especially in the campaign for Iwo Jima with the 5th Marine Division. These illustrations can be found in a book written by Charles R. Smith entitled Marines in the Revolution, published in 1975 as part of the Bicentennial Commemoration of the American Revolution. For the uninitiated, I believe it would be best to begin with the military definition of a Marine. And I quote, a Marine is a soldier who serves at sea or in a vessel of war either as part of its crew or as part of a military expedition under naval supervision. At various times throughout history, Marines have been referred to as soldiers of the sea. But a study of the past reveals that whether a soldier is a Marine depends not upon the name given him, but upon the character of the duty he performs, coupled with a familiarity of the sea and his subordination to naval jurisdiction. The Continental Marines were raised only one month after the Continental Navy had been established on 13 October 1775. The Continental Marines were raised by a resolution of the Second Continental Congress on Friday, 10 November 1775, depicted on the left, and actually formed in Tun Tavern along the waterfront of our nation's first capital in Philadelphia. Thus, the Marines have the distinction of being the only armed service to have been formed in a bar, which, which I'm sure did much to encourage recruiting. 
The site of the original Tunn's Tavern, depicted on the right, was located on the east side of South Border Street, between Chestnut and Walnut Streets. The proprietor of the establishment was a Robert Mullen, who would go on to raise a company and be given a commission as a captain of the Marine, and served subsequently during the critical 10 Crucial Days campaign, culminating in the pivotal battles of Trenton and Princeton, New Jersey, in December of 76 and January of 77. Many of the first recruits were selected because of their previous sea duty and wore a cast off combination of civilian, naval gear, and clothing, as depicted in the center. Sometime during the latter half of 1776, sufficient stocks of a uniform were accumulated and issued to some of them, namely a brown rifleman's hat and a green regimental coat with white facings and silver buttons adorned with a foul anchor device as depicted on the left. The waistcoat was white as were the stockings and breeches. Black half gaiters were worn to provide a degree of additional protection when on landing parties ashore. It is believed that these initial uniform items came from a supply of pre-war uniforms intended to be issued to the Philadelphia <coughs> Associator Company of Militia. It would also help to distinguish the Marines from the red of the British and the blue of the Continental Army. Marines, whether officer or enlisted, wore their hair long, powdered, clubbed, or cued, and dangled almost to their shoulder blades. A high leather collar was worn to provide a degree of protection from cutlass slashes and to promote proper posture. The latter uniform item would be retained as part of the current dress blues and would result in the adoption of a marine nickname, Leatherneck. By 1779, however, the facing would be changed to red, depicted on the right. The exact date and reason for the change remains a mystery to this day, but this would remain as a standard marine uniform till the end of the American Revolution. The first batch of recruits were recruited much the, the same traditional way of the period, by way of the recruiting party. Provided with a fifer and drummer, the potential recruits would literally be drummed up in the street and be herded like the Pied Piper to Tun's Tavern. There they would then be, and I quote, primed, given a shilling as an enlistment bonus, but I doubt given any opportunity to reconsider their decision. <coughs> this illustration is to pick the first boot camp, namely on and along the Willing and Morris waterfront walks, located a few, few blocks from Tunn's Staff, and ironically today, the location of the Dave and Busters. While we would like to think that they were model recruits, according to the existing muster rolls, these initial recruits like today's boots, encompassed a wide range of ages, sizes, professions, and character. In this painting, the only man standing correct under arms, in somewhat of a military stance, is the third man from the left, a former sailor with earring, petticoat breeches, cutlass, and a brown vest, brown vest issued tower musket, held somewhat correctly. Marines joined like members of the Continental Army to serve a term of one year or unless sooner discharged by Congress. The rest of the formation will have a lot to learn to please the seasoned, always disapproving drum instructor depicted in the Senate. Also portrayed are Captain Samuel Nichols and Lieutenant Matthew Park. Captain Samuel Nichols was a Philadelphia Quaker and also a graduate of the Philadelphia Academy, which would later become the University of Pennsylvania. Cap Captain Nichols would serve throughout the Revolution and eventually be promoted to the rank of major, the highest rank achieved by any <coughs> Continental Marine officer, and thus he is considered to be the first commandant of the Marine Corps. Ironically, 
on 10 November of each year. His gravesite in Philadelphia would be adorned with a wreath provided in an impromptu ceremony con conducted by a few good men, acknowledging his many contributions to our war of independence. There is also a link between the Nichols family and South Carolina in that the eldest of his, ch uh, of his children of three sons and one daughter named Samuel Nichols Mitchell would eventually marry Louise Pinkney, the daughter of C.C. Pinkney from <laughs> South Carolina. In this illustration, the Marines are serving high above the decks and the fighting tops of the ships they are marked upon, armed either with their 75 caliber brown vest short lamb pattern musket, or later in the war, the 69 caliber French Charleville musket, blunderbusses and or grenades. To offset the corrosive effects of the sea on small arms aboard ship, often the hardware of their muskets would be made with brass by time. As marksmen, their mission was to maintain a constant fire to clear the enemy decks and pick choice targets on the opposing British ships below, namely British officers. The Continental Marines were initially modeled after their British forebears, performing the same basic shipboard function. Besides clearing the enemy decks, the Continental Marines' primary mission were to maintain good order and discipline amongst the ship's crew, to safeguard the ship, weapon, and liquor lockers. Oh, I'm not going to say that. To protect the ship's captain from the possibilities of a mutinous crew, and when ordered to provide boarding and or landing partners for sure. Additionally, if needed to replace casualties, they would also serve as members of the ship's gun crews. The size of a ship's marine complement was dependent upon the ship's classification and or size and the availability of marine personnel. The general rule of thumb was that there should be one marine for each gun on board the ship, but there were many exceptions. The detachment was usually commanded by either a lieutenant or a captain who answered directly to the captain of the ship. The Continental Congress pre uh, prescribed the pay of the commissioned officers, while the pay of the enlisted Marine was the same as that of the Army, namely six and two-thirds dollars a month for privates. It is generally believed that the original orders for the 1st Navy Marine Amphibious Task Force was to set sail and attack an isolated British force <coughs> on Nova Scotia. However, after being icebound on the Delaware River during a long, hard, and boring winter guarding the docks of the Philadelphia Navy Yard, this first ATF sailed for a warmer climb and a more hospitable target. In due time, the small naval flotilla consisting of eight ships would be commanded by Commodore Isaac Hopkins, the commander of the Amphibious Task Force, or CATF. His landing force would consist of over 280 Marines, led by Captain Samuel Nichols as the commander of the landing force, or CLIF. Arriving off the sandy beaches of Nassau on the island of New Providence in the Bahamas, it proceeded to conduct the first amphibious landing in the history of the Marine Corps. 3 March 1776. Their objective was to capture a much needed supply of gunpowder, desperately needed by General George Washington and his con uh, Continental Army, currently besieging Boston at this critical time. In this bloodless operation, Captain Nichols and his Marines and Navy Tars would go ashore to capture two British forts, 88 cannons, 15 mortars, and a quantity of much needed ammunition and supplies. Although facing minimal opposition, it would be the most successful amphibious operation of the American Revolution. The first battle <coughs> fatality and large-scale sea battle with the Continental Navy and Marines occurred one month after the capture of the forts on New Providence. When a 20-gun ship of the Royal Navy, the Glasgow, carrying 150 men and her tender intercepted the Continental ship Alfred and Cabot, or Block Island, Rhode Island, in their return voyage from the New Providence 
grave on 6 April of 76. During a three hour night battle in the exchange of fire, the Alfred, one of whose junior officers were in command of a nine pound gun crew on the lower deck, was John Paul Jones, was badly damaged, and Marine Second Lieutenant John Fitzpatrick, stationed on the quarter deck next to Captain Samuel Nichols, became the first fatality to be listed on the Navy Marine casualty list, along with four enlisted Marines and four wounded. We know that initially General Benedict Arnold was considered one of George Washington's most trusted and aggressive commanders. His request for skilled sailors and Marines to fight his small fleet of gondolas on Lake Champlain brought him, in his, own, in his own words, in contact with, and I quote, a wretched motley crew, the Marines the refuse of every regiment, and the seamen, few of them ever wet with salt water, end of quote. However, the latter would serve as Marines, and it would be the same dregs in October of 76 that would fight the superior British forces to a standstill, a standstill at Balfour Island on Lake Champlain. Two days later, almost out of the ammunition, with the British closing in and with his makeshift fleet aground, General Arnold himself applied the torch to his last remaining vessel to prevent its capture and use by the British. The Marines and sailors, meanwhile, stripped the vessels of their powder, weapons, gear, and brought off their dead and wounded. After establishing themselves ashore, the Marines were ordered to form a line to defend the vessels and delay the advance of the approaching enemy. They would then subsequently make their way through both the British and their Indian allies back to Crown Point, New York. With winter fast approaching, the British soon withdrew northward. The result would be that the conquest of Fort Ticonderoga and the invasion through central New York would have to be postponed for another year. But the time purchased by the men of General Arnold's fleet allowed regiments to be raised that in 77 would meet and defeat General John Burgoyne's invading army in Saratoga, helping to convince the French to join the American effort and change the course of the war and dare I say, subsequent world history. Not readily known are the facts that both state and continental Marines were part of the naval forces that assisted in the operation to eliminate or confiscate river craft that could support the British crossing the Delaware River in pursuit of General George Washington's beleaguered army before it could safely cross in early December of 76. The Continental Army scouts would report that so thorough was their effort that for 50 miles above and below Trenton, New Jersey, not a boat remained in disloyal hands. Serviceable, uh, serviceable boats were confiscated and either docked or hidden on the Delaware's West Bank, while those unserviceable were scuttled, greatly hindering the British pursuit that bared the fox. Among the troops assembled for the winter campaign of 76 and 77 were three company of Marines from the Philadelphia Navy Yard, who were originally given the mission to outfit the frigates under construction for the Continental Navy, while placed under the command of the recently promoted Major Samuel Nichols. However, in December of 76, another task took precedence, and the Marines were ordered in the words of Major Nichols, and I quote, to march and be placed under the command of His Excellency, the Commander-in-Chief. At this time, General Washington, who was the Continental Army, having been chased across New York and New Jersey, were positioned on the west side of the Delaware River. These were the times that try men's souls. When the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot would, in this conflict, shrink from the service of the country. This would be the first of several times that the Marines would serve ashore as a fighting force under direct command of the Continental Army's authority. The composite Marine Battalion of 141 men would be placed in the 2nd Battalion of Brigadier General John Cadwallader's Pennsylvania Brigade. Quartered in Bristol on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River, they were supposed to participate 
in the three-pronged attack of General Washington's assault on Trenton on Christmas Day of 76. However, upon their arrival at the intended crossing site, they found the river was choked with ice and that the crossing had to be delayed. It was, however, eventually accomplished, but too late to be of any material contribution to the memorable victory at Trenton, New Jersey. Subsequently crossing the river, it was soon positioned and isolated at Burlington on the New Jersey side of the Delaware River. Meanwhile, it was then determined by General Washington to maneuver to attack the British base at Princeton, New Jersey, and maybe even capture a 70,000 pound British payroll, reported to be stashed at their base in Brunswick, New Jersey. However, the initial assault on Princeton of 2 January of 77 was repulsed and began to melt away, with the Marines retiring as well. General Washington, fearing her out after such a recent startling victory at Trenton, rode to his, with his personal guard and trooped the line in front of his army, leading by example. The Continental Army of Marines then renewed the attack and drove the British from the field. For the first time in the Revolution, the hindquarters of the British lobster bag had been seen, but it would not be the last. In this engagement, the Marine Battalion suffered 61 casualties from its 141-man battalion. After the Battle of Princeton, some 80 Marines continued to serve with Washington's Continental Army as either infantry or artillery through the winter encampment at Morristown or Jockey Hollow, under conditions that were far worse than the following winter of 78 and 79 at Valley Forge. The remaining Marines returned to provide security for the Philadelphia Navy Yard and escort, escorting some 25 British POWs from the battles of Trenton and Princeton back to Philadelphia. The Continental Marines were no strangers to action on the intercoastal rivers, today called littoral operations. They started early during the days of the Revolution, as depicted here in this painting on the Delaware River. With the British increasing their hold on the Delaware River, they would eventually capture Philadelphia in September of 77. Three Patriot forts defended the Delaware, Fort Mercer, Fort Mifflin, and Fort Billingsman. Although Marines were posted to the first two, only a mere 112 Pennsylvania militiamen under the command of Colonel William Bradford, defended Billingsport. On October 28th, two crack British regiments, the 10th and the 43rd, the infamous Black Watch, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Sterling, moved along the Delaware River, pushing Patriot forces before them. Early in October of 77, it was decided to abandon the Patriot Fort at Billingsport, New Jersey. A landing party of Marines, depicted here, led by Lieutenants Dennis Leary and William Barney, from the brig Andrew Dory, are depicted in the process of covering the evacuation of the garrison from the fort at Billingsport, New Jersey, to Fort Mifflin, in Pennsylvania, under fire from the advancing British troops on 2 Oct October 77. The Marines were able to save much of the ammunition, despite the fort's five guns, set of blades and engage elements of the Black Watch before retiring back on board the Andrew Dory. The defense of Fort Mifflin on the Delaware River was the last shore action, exclusive of amphibious raids and landing on the part of, on the, part of the Continental Marine. Now, notice the Marine that's carrying a rum bag. This depiction, believe it or not, maybe that's why I never served at Headquarters Marine Corps, this depiction caused a bit of controversy when the painting was reviewed by senior officers before its release at Headquarters Marine Corps. However, notice the black bands around the keg, which are iron. And since iron and black powder don't mix because of the possibility of sparks and an accidental detonation, it can be rightfully referred to as a rum barrel, and the matter was laid to rest. 
I'm sure they got more important things. <laughs> or I hope so. The very first Betsy Ross type flag to fly over foreign soil was when Captain Trevet and 28 Marines from the Continental Sloop Providence stole the shore in the dead of night during the second raid on Nassau on 28 January of 78. The ship's Marine detachment made their way through a hole in the fort's palisade to overpower the guards and secure the fort. At dawn, Captain Trevet ordered the stars and stripes run up the flagpole as a signal that the fort had changed hands and to serve as a warning to any ships in the harbor that if they attempted to lift anchor in order to set sail, they risked being blown out of the water. Captain Trevet also announced to the surprised townspeople that he had 300 Marines in the fort and that they were very hungry and thirsty. Mysteriously, rum rations and provisions were quickly supplied by the townspeople before the Marines and sailors made off with much booty, inclusive of five vessels and a supply of much needed powder and cannonballs for the Continental Army and Navy, in addition to releasing from captivity 30 American POWs. Very few realize that some 11 states had organized separate state navies during the American Revolution, which in actuality outnumbered the Continental Navy, and at least eight states had organized state marines. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia as adjuncts to their state navies. All these but Maryland's were in being before the Continental Congress formed, ironically, the Continental Marines. Early in 78, while Washington and the Continental Army and endured a grim winter at Valley Forge, Naval Captain James Willing organized a volunteer company of 34 Pennsylvania and Virginia State Marines, composed of, well, let's just say, hardened, hard-drinking soldiers, frontiersmen, and buckskinners from Fort Pitt. The expedition soon set sail in January 77 on their armed galley here, known as the Rattle Trap, conducting patrols along a 1,000 mile corridor down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers in an attempt to win the hearts and minds or force the neutrality of the inhabitants along its riverbanks and possibly in the process gain control of British West Florida. A final patrol went all the way down the Mississippi River, destroying Loyalist-owned property and liberating much loot and slaves along the way. When they reached Spanish New Orleans, the British tried to have the local government jail them as pirates. After Spain declared war against Great Britain in June of 79, some Marines remained in West Florida to assist the Spanish invasion forces, but most managed to depart. However, some returned upriver to join George Rogers Clark in the Northwest Territory, and others went back to the East Coast by sea. Captain Willing eventually became a British prisoner bound for New York, but would soon be exchanged for Lieutenant Governor Henry Hamilton of Detroit in 1781. The British like to think that they have never been invaded in modern times. Napoleon couldn't do it, nor could I offer but Captain John Paul Jones, his sailors, and a few leatherneck on board the Ranger sailed to the British, uh, excuse me, the Irish Sea, and raided Whitehaven and St. Mary's Isle in April of 78. The raid, to be honest with you, really didn't accomplish much, but it did cause a great deal of consternation amongst the British ports and coastal communities. Leading some 30 Marines divided amongst two boats, Captain Jones commanded one boat, as you see on the right, and Marine Second Lieutenant Samuel Wallingford, the other, with the mission of burning the ships in the harbor, capturing the fort, <coughs> spiking the guns, and sacking the town. In my research, I found that legend has it that the first building they came down, <coughs> they turned out, <coughs> was a, a tavern. <laughs> and for some strange reason, the raid mysteriously ended on a very happy note. 